Greetings and salutations. Welcome back to the shoebox. And I hope and pray with all my heart through the spirit that you are now perceiving things in a slightly different way. And it is also the hope of my heart that as we progress, your eyes will start to look deeper into the things which seem obvious, but the meaning of those things that seem obvious will gradually change more and more and more as you start to rise within yourself. That means your understanding will begin to rise up and everything will begin to become exciting. Your uh, investigations into the word of God, you will start to see that what I'm telling you is true. So be patient. Don't be locked in religion and tradition and all the usual ways because I did all those things. You can trust me. I'm speaking to you before God. I did all those things and the benefits was very, very little. So what we're going to do now is an exciting journey, a real exodus within yourself and uh, progress more and more and more. And these things will make more and more sense to you as I open up the, the principles of which you need to apply in your own spiritual life. So let's uh, begin by saying that we must ascend. That means you must rise, climb within the mind and heart out of darkness. That's the sp spiritual condition of the fallen world. Out of ignorance. What is ignorance? It's lack of knowledge. It is things that you're unaware of. That is what is ignorance. It's not an insult. It's just that there are things that you are unaware of. So we're coming out of ignorance into the full illumination of the Holy Spirit or by the illumination of the Holy Spirit. This is what we call illuminated. And another word for illuminated is enlightened. So this is our target. This is our objective is to become illuminated or if you want to say that, enlightened. It's the same thing. So we're going to read, first of all, from the scriptures in the New Testament. And we're going to go to my old favorite book, John 6, 62 to 63. And it says here, what and if ye shall see, ye means all of you, Ye shall see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before. Where was he before? He was in paradise. And so this is also our objective, is to bring you step by step back into the presence of God, which is paradise. It is the spirit that quickens. The spirit brings you back to life. What does that mean? It means that you lost your spiritual life in the process of falling because you disconnected from the source of life, which is God. So this spirit that we're given by grace quickens you, brings you back to life, and that is when Slowly, slowly, but surely, your perception begins to change. It is the spirit that quickens. The flesh profits nothing. And remember I told you in a previous lesson that we are actually locked and bolted and paralyzed because all our thinking, all our understanding, all our perception is locked up in and within the flesh which refuses to let go and refuses not to lose, lose its seat of power. It wants to remain king. Who wants to remain king? The ego of yourself wants to remain king and is frightened 
to lose that position. So that's why I say there will be a struggle because your flesh, your fleshy thinking, your fleshy mind, your academia will want to hold on to its position which is held all your life. So this is where the flesh profits, which means gains or advances, nothing. Nothing is zero. You will not make any advancement back towards God through and by the operations of the flesh, because the flesh can only make religion, and religion will never advance you. So that is an explanation of those, of those words. And then Jesus goes on to say, this is the master. This is Christ. Don't ignore him. Listen carefully to what he's saying. This is the Christ. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. And that's not any old life. It is the eternal life that we lost. So if we go now from there to John 4, 24, we see another piece of scripture that I think I've mentioned before, but it doesn't matter if I repeat myself because I always tie the scriptures to flow for you, to help you understand the points that Jesus are making. So if you've heard this before from me, it doesn't matter. We're just making all these scriptures flow together in a golden thread so that it's easy for you to comprehend what the master is saying. Don't forget we've had 2,000 years of religion. And in 2,000 years of religion, the world is still in the mess that it's always been. So you can say politely, we've achieved nothing. So that's why it's imperative that we start looking back with the master listening to the master christ who will lead you into the purpose of god which is back into paradise that's the intention of god and it says in john 4 24 god is a spirit and they that worship him must that's imperative. It's not a request that perhaps maybe might be. You must worship him in spirit, within spirit. In means within. In, within, spirit, and in truth. There is only one truth, so don't be confused about this truth, because the truth is the word. Jesus prayed to the Father, that we might be sanctified by the truth. And he said, your word is truth. So that's the only truth that we must worship God in, is the truth of God, which, as Jesus prayed for, sanctifies you, which means cleanses and washes you. Washes and cleanses you from what? The corruptions of man doctrines, which keeps you earthbound and nailed into darkness. That's why we, we must, imperative, must worship the Father who is spirit in spirit and in truth, which is his word. That to me is amazing. It's simple, but it's beautiful and it's amazing. Truth equals light. Light is truth. Truth equals light, and light is illumination. And illumination is enlightenment. So the intention of this word is to illumine your soul. Because as I said to you in a previous message, this Bible is a book of the soul, for the soul, to bring you back to paradise, which is within yourself. Now let's go to John 3, 6. We've done a lot of work in my favorite book today. Sorry about that. If it's not yours, but it's my favorite book. <laughs> so we're going to go to John 3, 6. And it says, 
that which is born of the flesh is flesh, no mistake. And that which is born of the spirit is spirit. So There's two different worlds, the physical realm and the spiritual realm. And to come into the spiritual realm, as Jesus told Nicodemus during the night, you must be born again. This is a real spiritual birth that has to take place within your soul, within your heart. Otherwise, perception of spiritual things will be practically impossible. This is why Jesus was speaking to the master, Dr. Nicodemus, an old man, master of the law, the books of Moses. He couldn't understand. He said, what, must a man climb back into the womb from where he was born? But what Nicodemus didn't understand is he was already born in the flesh and was flesh. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. What Jesus was showing him, that he had to have a second birth into the realm of the spirit. Otherwise, you cannot see the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God is inside yourself. So from there, we'll go to Romans 8, 11. When you're ready, let's go. Give me the thumbs up. Yes, I can see you. I can see you. <laughs> if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwells in you, lives in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken, bring back to life your mortal body. This one, this one, this body, this mortal body will be brought back to life by the power of the spirit, which is a duplicate of what Christ did when he rose up from the tomb on the third day. We need to duplicate that in the spirit. He that raised up Christ from the dead shall also, shall also, just like Christ, shall also quicken your mortal bodies by what? By his, God's Elohim's spirit that dwells in, within yourself. So this is a complete duplication of the resurrection of Christ. You have to be resurrected. Because, as I said to you clearly, you were born dead, spiritually disconnected from God, and you have to be quickened back by the power of the Spirit before you can even cry, Abba, Father. Because in your previous condition, you are not of Abba, Father. You are of darkness. You are the sons of Satan. And I will prove that to you. It's shocking. Yes, I know. It was shocking for me. I cried because I'd been deceived just like the world is deceived. We have to come out of this illusion of darkness, which is not reality. It's only reality, as I told you last week, last session, when you give it power. And so with the truth, when somebody comes and tells you the truth, you no longer respect that lie that illusion and as you receive more truth through these sessions you will start to see the cracks in this lie and it will start to collapse and it will no longer possess you as a slave to darkness so can you see the purpose of these lessons i hope you're following me nicely gently we're not going difficult we're not going hard i'm just bringing you up the steps nice and slowly so that you have time to think about what I'm saying, because to many of you, what I'm saying is a shock. So hold on to your trousers, because I'm going to shock you many times. And don't forget, I had a big part of my life in religion, so I do know what I'm talking about. The world that I'm leading you in 
is completely and absolutely different. Although I have to say very quickly, it's not mine. These things were given to me through the spirit and the understanding was given to me and Jesus opened my eyes and my ears and released me from paralysis. Otherwise I couldn't talk in this fashion, in this way. So this plan is not mine. This method is not mine. I don't claim ownership for anything at all. The only thing I am is a donkey, the mouth that speaks the word of God. So listen carefully and we'll reveal more and more and more in steps um, this situation that humankind has found itself in. So let's go to Romans 8.14. Romans 8.14 is another one of my favorite books. There is so much information in Romans about what I'm talking about now. One day we'll cover Romans and we'll open it right up so you can see that all I've been saying all along from the beginning is absolutely 100% truth. You will see it for yourself as long as you check me out when I finish each session. Go to the Bible yourself and check me out according to the scriptures that I give you and you'll find that in your religious life or whatever you belong to, whatever group you belong to, if you check out these words and just meditate on these words in silence, pray that the Holy Spirit opens your understanding, you will see that all these scriptures are perfectly spiritual and correct. You're just not used to somebody who's opened up the windows so fast that's what we're doing okay so we're going into romans now 8 14. very simple what it says but it doesn't make sense in the flesh it only makes sense in the spirit watch for as many as are led that means directed as many as are directed by the spirit of god they are the sons, and in the Aramaic language, the ancient Aramaic language, it means the children of God is a more accurate um, translation. So they are the children of God, Elohim. That's the uh, ancient word for God, Elohim. So how can you be led by a spirit on the outside? Well, you can't. And this is proof of what I said in an uh, earlier session, that we don't follow the Shekinah anymore. That belongs to the Old Testament. And remember I told you the Old Testament is a school book preparing you for university. Now we are in the introductions, introduction lessons within the University of God. So we need to put on big trousers now big shoes and start to walk like a person who has grown and not a child. That's why St. Paul tells us that when he was a child, he played with childish things, toys. But now he's become a man. He has put away the childish things. So the Old Testament is God's school book to prepare you for the New Testament the time when Christ becomes the high priest and not Aaron or his sons. Christ now is the high priest of the temple of which you are. You are the temple of God. So all that preparation was to get us to where we are now. So you're not being led by the Shekinah, the external cloud filled with fire within the big pillar of fire. You're not following that. That's physical following from physical country to physical country, carrying out all kinds of physical things. Now you're doing the same, but in a much higher level. You're making the same journey, but in the spiritual realms, which is the whole point of why the Christ high priest, the Messiah, is so superior to the old things and all those sacrifices of animals this is far superior stuff a far superior priesthood and this high priest has no end 
unlike the previous priests who all died after a certain age. And so they had to be changed and replaced and changed and replaced. This high priest is eternal because he is not just called Christ Jesus. His name was given to him as Emmanuel, God with us. So let's go now from there to 1 Corinthians 6, 17. And now we find the connection of how we are able to follow. If we don't have the cloud, how can we follow? Well, it tells you in 1 Corinthians 6, 17, that he that is joined unto the Lord, he that is connected unto the Lord, is one spirit. Now, how many groups and organizations have you seen in this world that fight and compete and disagree with each other? I've seen more than I care to mention. And all of them fight each other, disagree with each other. But here you're told the Lord is one spirit, not 25, not 560, not international churches, buildings. There is one spirit and you have to be born of that spirit. You have to have that spirit inhabiting you. And that spirit that should be inhabiting you once you are born again will raise you up from your spiritual position of being dead, disconnected from God. And you will be led not by the Shekinah, but by that one spirit. And if you become born of that one spirit, let me show you uh, straight off the top of my head, which always rings around my head and I, because I think it's beautiful, is in that one spirit, there is no Jew or Greek. So therefore, think, think, think. There is no race discrimination in that one spirit. There is no Jew or Greek. That clearly means, think, there is no race discrimination. There is no bond or free. In the time of St. Paul, in the time of Jesus, there were many, 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 many slaves in this world, particularly under the ruling of the Roman Empire. So the difference between a ruling class and a slave is miles apart. But in the spirit, there is no miles apart. There is no race discrimination. Also, we are told clearly that when we're in that spirit, there is no male, there is no female. Think, if you are born of the spirit and you're female, what is the difference between old George here being born of the spirit, if it's the same one spirit, what is the difference? <laughs> there is none. It's a ridiculous statement. And one of the other ridiculous things that I experienced in my previous times in traveling amongst the Orthodox world, amongst the religious world, there is lots of separating and dividing of people. But now we are in Christ, in the spirit. There's no Jew, no Greek, no bond, no free, no class discrimination, no male, no female, because you're all born of the one Holy Spirit, which is of God. That's your connection to God. And that is what is going to guide you out of the lies and deception of this darkness into the freedom and joy of the light. And that's our intention to lead you slowly as a shepherd with sheep, nice and gentle into divine truth. And I hope that scrapped and trashed any other big fat ideas that you may have encountered during your own spiritual walk. Let's hope that's been washed out and dealt with once and for all. So let's continue. We're now going to dive into 1 Corinthians 6, 14. And this is to emphasize 
and give confirmation of what many people get nervous about because they always associate this with some kind of death when your life has ended and that's when this take, takes place. It's another lie, it's another deception that the world hangs on to. But let's see what 1 Corinthians, the first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 6, verse 14, it's very short, fast, and direct. It says, God has both raised up the Lord. He's done that. That's your confirmation. And will also, so both is tied up with will also, raise up us. What by? How? By his own power. What is that power? Think. That power is the same power that raised Christ Jesus from the tomb. That same power is the Holy Spirit because Jesus was raised by the Holy Spirit from the tomb. So you may say to yourself, well, where's my tomb? I'm not in the tomb. Well, yes, you are. You are the tomb. You're locked in that tomb. The stone is rolled across you and you can't get out. You've been dead there for some time. You're probably stinking by now. I'm just joking. <laughs> <laughs> God has both raised up the Lord Christ Jesus and will also raise up us by his own power. And that power is the same power that he raised up Jesus, the power of the Holy Spirit. And it is that which will cause you to ascend out of darkness into light. So I hope I'm not making anybody angry, not here to make anybody angry here to make you think and think deeply all right so now we're going to go into john 1 10 to 13 and i have to say i read this before in an earlier session don't worry sometimes i'll repeat them but they're to get the flow and emphasize the point that's why i use them the gospel of john chapter 1 verses 10 to 13 here we go let's go he was in the world. Who was in the world? Christ, Emmanuel. God was with us. And the world was made by him. And the world knew him not. Why? Because he just looked like me and you. He came unto his own. Who? The people of Israel. They were his own. He brought them out of physical Egypt. He came unto his own. And his own received him not. Christ came to the physical kingdom of God, the physical kingdom, with a physical temple, out of a physical um, Egypt, with a physical Pharaoh. All that is divine instruction. Yes, it happened historically. Yes, it is Jewish history. Yes, yes, yes. I am not denying any of that. But within it, what I'm trying to open your eyes to see is that is a map, a school book of your own spiritual exodus, which is what all these teachings are about. You need to get on that train. The quicker you realize it, the quicker you perceive it with your spiritual eyes, the quicker your journey will begin. And all the school books, you will use them purely for spiritual instruction in the divine journey to bring you home. He came unto his own and his own received him not, but as many as received him. Well, I wasn't there when Jesus came to Israel, you're gonna say, not applicable to me. Well, sorry, it is absolutely applicable to you because you have to receive him or not receive him. And you have to receive him in the manner and the design of which I am speaking of. The Christ has to come into you. He has to enter into you to lead you. So as many as received him, to them, are you listening? To them, to you, if you receive him within your soul, if you receive him within your house as a guest, what house? This house is your guest chamber. 
As many as received him, to them gave he power. What power? We already had that one. The Holy Spirit. He gave them power to become. Notice become. You're not until you become. And you will not become unless you're born of the Spirit. It's all important. And it's, you can see all what I'm saying to you fits without any difficulty. You put a couple of big spoons full of religion in there and it doesn't make sense anymore. But when you get the freedom of the spirit and you think and your eyes are opening to these words, you'll see they all fit perfectly and make total sense. In another way, the way of the flesh, they don't make any sense at all, which is why religion is so difficult to follow, why theology never makes any sense and all theologian doctors are all disagreeing and fighting with each other because they don't know. And they don't know because they don't follow the spirit of Christ. So we must make a choice. Receive Christ within your house or not. He gave them power to become the sons. That means the children of God. Even to them, what does it take? that believe, have faith in the Christ, faith to welcome him as your guest here, home, to dine with him. Dine with what? Some burgers at McDonald's? Are you going to get a takeaway? Absolute garbage. Physical food is of no use. You must have spiritual food, which the master will bring with him, and you will sit with him in your home as Christ sat with many people who were sinners, because that's what we are. And he sat and ate with them. The physical is pointing to the spiritual. This has to be a reality within your own house. Because this is going to become cleansed and sanctified. And this is going to become the house of God. That's the purpose of Jesus entering into your home. So as many as received him, received means to bring him in, to bring him in, to join you. Received him, to them gave you power, spiritual power, Holy Spirit, to become, because you're not, you have to become the sons, the children of God even to them that believe on his name. Now watch this. Here's the conclusion, and here's the key to unlock the door. Not my words, which were born not of blood. That's not of your family. Nor of the will of the flesh. Nor of the will of man. In other words, you cannot obtain this by your own effort, by your own desire, by your own strength. Not of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of, that means your roots have to be coming out from God, born of God, born of the spirit of God that must take place. And I love that piece of scripture because to me, it clears up so much rubbish. It cleans so much garbage out of the cupboard. And you start to see things as you're supposed to see things, which is coming from the root of the spirit, where everything, as I said, makes total sense. In Psalm 119, verse 130, I'll say that again, Psalm 119, the biggest psalm in the Bible. Verse 130. What does it say here? This is beautiful. This is why I'm talking about the word of God. On and on and on. But now we get a psalm, which was incidentally, was always sung by the choir of the Jews in the temple. And it was accompanied very often with instruments. Because they were always praising, praising, praising. They had reason to praise. What reason did they have to praise? God himself brought them out of captivity. Do you have reason to praise 
Well, now you're listening to these lessons. I hope you have lots of reasons to praise because you're going to be brought by God out of darkness into light. So these Psalms are applicable to you. Don't think they're not. They're absolutely applicable to you. And you need to get your instrument out of the cupboard, your guitar or your harp or whatever you got. And you need to praise God Almighty because it says here in 119 verse 130, the entrance of thy words gives light. The entrance of thy words gives light. Light is illumination. It gives understanding unto the simple. Because illumination that we're talking about is not external illumination, not a light in your living room, not the sun outside. This illumination is an internal illumination that comes from within the word. And the words, as I will show you, they are spirit and they are life. We'll cover that in a moment. So Psalm 119, 130, the entrance. That's the words entering into your heart and soul. The entrance of thy words, the words of God, gives light because in them is concealed the food of life. It gives understanding to the simple. Not stupid, but people who don't have a problem with their egos. People who are humble and rejoice for the chance to have an experience with the Holy Father, the Father of love and mercy. Now, what I'm going to do now is clarify to you light. It's very important that we understand correctly light because there are two kinds of lights. And if you go to the trouble of when this uh, program is finished, go to the trouble of reading Genesis 1 right in the beginning. And you'll see the first thing that's created is light. And then God separates that light from darkness. Are you hearing this? It's very, very deep in Genesis 1. Therefore, God creates the sun and the moon. So God is never talking about the sun and the moon when he's talking about this light. And in another place, you'll see Jesus who calls out to the thousands at the temple that he was the light of the world. That means the world without Christ living in you, the population of the world without Christ living in them are walking in darkness. Now we're beginning to see that this light is a special light. So what I want to do is I've actually made for you a diagram. You'll see lots of diagrams that I give you from time to time. And this diagram, I thought the best way to teach you this light was to investigate the human eye. And I'm going to show you the human eye. And I'm going to introduce the pieces to you. And I'm sure you can read it from where you're sitting. Just look at those words. There's nothing complicated here. And you have two of these, not one, you have two. All of us have two, unless we've had an injury. And you can see there the iris, the pupil, the cornea, the ciliary body, the retina, the optic nerves, and at the top, the crystalline lens. So, Use those to help me to teach you because I'm going to keep myself out of the way and I'm going to show you what takes place in this eye. Many people don't know this, what I'm going to tell you. Many people do. So if you are one, and there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds who don't know, but if you are one of those, then you've learned something today if you don't learn anything else. The eye captures and focuses light like a camera. Light enters the eye through the cornea. There it is here. 
From the cornea, the light passes through the pupil. You all see the pupil? There it is. The amount of light passing through is regulated by the iris. So that regulates, like a camera, the amount of light that comes in. From there, the light then hits the lens. And the transparent structure inside the eye, which focuses the light rays, rays onto the retina. So the light rays are focused onto the retina. There's the retina, and here's the retina. So off we go there. Finally, it reaches the retina, the light sensitive nerve layer that lines the back of the eye where the image appears inverted. In other words, upside down. The optic nerve, there's the optic nerve, carries signals, that's electric, electrical pulses of light, dark and colors to the area of the brain. That area in the brain is known as the visual cortex. That's the name of the part of the brain that deals with this light, which assembles the signals into images. And it is that which is known as our vision. So what did you notice, those of you who don't know? Not so worried about clever clogs and those who know everything. <laughs> These lessons are simple, but they're powerful. You don't actually see anything with your eyeball, nothing at all. It is a receptor of light, just like my glasses are a lens. Your eye is a lens that receives a controlled amount of light because you've got shutters on the inside of the eye that control the amount of light that you receive. Where does that light come from? It's physical light. It's light from the sun. Genesis 1 comes from there. It's an external source of light. And it bounces off the tree leaves. You know yourself, a leaf is all kinds of shapes. So as the light hits the leaf, it will bounce in a certain direction. When the light hits this side of the, uh, of the leaf, it will bounce in another direction. So it's bouncing in all directions. And light is bouncing off of everything. And it's bouncing into your eye, which is the receptor of that light, just like a camera. But your eye is not seeing anything as you know vision is. All of us are exactly the same. No one is different. So all this light is bouncing off, off the grass, off the trees, off the buildings, off your car, off everything. And it's all being received into the eye. What's the next thing when that light comes in, as I said to you? It's changed through the retina. That's those two lines behind the eye. All the way to the nerve. Remember, light is energy, power through electrical pulses in that retina going into the optic nerve, it sends a signal into the brain, which I told you was the visual cortex. That's the name of the department. If you work in a big block of buildings or a big building full of different offices, all those offices are responsible for different functions. And your brain is a block of offices and they're all responsible for different jobs. And so when it gets into that visual uh, cortex, that's where those electrical pulses, those electrical signals are changed into images. Now, this is not a science program or a program of anatomy, but it's really, really, really important for you to understand that because that's how physical external light is dealt with, controlled and packaged into your information. 
And I don't care if that information is coming in as you're driving your car, making a cake, a new dress, running down the road, reading a book, or listening to the lecturer at university that writes things on the blackboard. It's all external information, external light, which is being gathered into the brain and sorted into images. From those images comes understanding. From those images comes understanding. Now I think you're catching my thread because the light that I'm speaking about is the light that is in Genesis 1 long before the sun is made. And this light is the word that became flesh. This light is the truth which collapses the lie. This light is the illumination which directs you and leads you and guides you and gives you understanding for your spiritual journey. So therefore now I've shown you there is a distinct difference between external light, which produces religion, and internal light, which guides you on a true experience, a true spiritual journey. It's like, for example, two sides of a coin. Two sides. We say in England, heads or tails. It has two sides on every coin. You've got the literal interpretation. You've got the spiritual interpretation hidden within all objects in the physical world is spiritual information. And I was talking to you the other week about how the sheep chew the cud. And when they've collected the grass, it goes down into the first stomach, back up into the mouth, into a ball. That ball is chewed and crushed, which is the essence of that grass, the food of that grass. And we must do that ourselves because Jesus calls us the sheep. And we know him as the shepherd who is leading us into pastures and still cool water. Those are metaphors for the spiritual life. So to me, Psalm 23 is absolutely beautiful because I see Jesus leading us beside those still waters, which means leading us into paradise, leading us into peace away from all the inhibitions of darkness. So you see, also when Jesus spoke of Herod the king, who was a particularly nasty individual, and he says, tell that old fox. What does he mean, tell that old fox? Well, Jesus is speaking and taking out of the fox because it was the father who made the fox, the same as the sheep. But the characteristics of that fox is sneaky. It is destructive. It is a killer. And that's what Jesus was meaning about King Herod. He was using the characteristics of the fox that's hidden within the fox to tell us spiritual truth about Herod. In the prodigal son, you all know this. I'm giving you the easy ones that you know, that you're familiar with on a regular basis. Prodigal son, where does he finish up? Living with the pigs. Pigs are used for human operations. You can take a valve out of the heart of a pig and put it in the human because it's almost the same. But the important thing is to find the characteristics of a pig because a pig eats anything, any garbage. And that's where the prodigal son found himself. They only care about themselves. They're greedy, immensely greedy human beings. They're immensely destructive if they're hungry human beings. They use each other for sex and to keep warm. So they're using their other friends and brothers' bodies for their own benefit. That is the characteristic of human beings. And the more you study this, and we'll go into this as a particular session where God teaches the Jewish nation 
not to eat this food, not to eat that food, not to eat the other food, but you can eat this food and you're allowed to eat that food. God was never talking about food ever once. He was talking about divine spiritual instruction because all those different kinds of foods that you can't eat, they are the different members of society that are a very bad influence on your soul. And the good food that you was allowed to eat, which was called clean food, they are descriptions of the food that God wants you to eat, to consume. So we are all potentially food for each other, be it bad or good, to help us to grow, to destroy our spiritual life. So God never ever once was speaking about food ever. It was physical food for the Jews. And yes, they separated themselves from all those foods because the Jewish people at Mount Sinai, at the foot of Mount Sinai, told Moses, everything that God says, we shall do it. We will do it. Ah. And they never did it. They failed and failed and failed because they misunderstood that all this law, which is continues through all the five books of Moses, was spiritual and they were carnal. They were physical. They were fallen. And so everything that they understood was understanding from the wrong place, from the wrong root, which is why they messed up everything. But God allowed it to go on, knowing that it would stop at a point. And that full stop was Christ Jesus on Golgotha when it was all washed away. The temple curtain into the presence of God was torn from top to bottom. That means the old earthly priesthood is finished. Don't need it. We've had all the instruction we need. 1,500 years of instruction. Don't need any more than that. And now we've had 2,000 years of spiritual instruction, but we didn't make any benefit. That's why I'm here, to help us to hold hands together, to make a benefit of what has been done. The Jews crucified Christ physically. The Gentiles have crucified Christ spiritually. The same thing, exactly the same thing. And so let's get all this physical light out of the way so that we can concentrate on the spiritual light that is within us when we invite, when we allow the Christ to come into this house. So now, let us turn to the next scripture. John 1 verse 4 is where I'd like you to follow me, if you don't mind. John 1, verse 4. And it says very clearly, in him, in Christ, the Messiah, was life. This is eternal life. This is eternal life. Not any old life, it's eternal life. And the life, the eternal life, equals God. Eternal life is God. And the life, that's the eternal life, God, was the light of men. What do we mean, was the light of men? It means it's the illumination of men. It's that inner light. The life is the light of men. Without that light, a man doesn't have light. Neither does a woman, because we're talking collectively, the children of God. In him, the Messiah was life. That's eternal life. And the life, eternal life, equals God, was the light, the illumination of men. What is the illumination of men? Think. It's the enlightenment of men. It's the enlightenment of men. 
You have to be illumined. You have to be enlightened. And this light radiates from the Christ who is Emmanuel, God with us. So in John 1, 6 to 9, John 1, 6 to 9, that's the gospel, gospel of John again. And this is where you've heard this before, but don't worry, just hold on to your trousers because I want to emphasize this point. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. I told you before in the Hebrew, it's Johanan. The same came for a witness. Remember, Jesus said to the Pharisees, I have a greater witness than that of John, but this is what John came for. He came for a witness. To bear witness, that means to carry witness of the light, the inner light, that all men through him might believe. This was John's work, to get people ready for the coming of the light, for the coming of dawn, not physically, spiritually. He was not that light. John excludes himself from this. He was not that light but was sent to bear witness, to carry witness of that particular light that you will find in Genesis. That was the true light. This is no fake, this is no lie. This is the true light, which lights, illuminates, enlightens every man that comes into the world. Without this light, you will remain in darkness you remain in darkness, you, you remain in captivity. The captivity is yourself. You must be illuminated. You must be enlightened to realize what is reality from the illusion of lies. It's imperative that you learn these truths. So now we go on to Psalm 119, 18. One of my favorite Psalms. Open thou my eyes, that I may behold. What does behold mean? That's a very old English word. It means to see or to observe something or someone of remarkable or impressive nature. Behold is to observe something or someone remarkable or of an impressive nature. So this psalm, remember all these psalms are praises and prayers to God the Almighty. Open thou my eyes, this is what we've been speaking about, the inner eye, not the external eye, that I may behold, that I may see these impressive, remarkable things out of the law. When we say the law, when the Jews speak about the law, when the people of Israel speak about the law, they're talking about the five books of Moses. This is the, called the Torah. And the Torah means divine instruction. Do you hear that? The Jewish called the first five books divine instruction, the Torah. We Christians don't do that, but we should, because it is divine instruction from Elohim, God the Almighty. Psalm 119, 105. Follow that quickly with Psalm 119, 105. Biggest Psalm in the, in the Bible. Thy word, that's the word of God, Elohim. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. What? <laughs> a light unto my feet means it's guiding you. Not externally, internally. And that same light illuminates the path that you have to walk and progress on spiritually, not external. Can you see the difference in thinking? When we're in the fallen thinking, everything is external. When we're in the spiritual realm, it becomes fantastic. It becomes exciting. It becomes impersonal. And it should be, because it's designed to be. School book's finished. We're out of that class. We're in the university now. And we have a lot of work to do and a big journey to make. But it's exciting. 
and every day you are fed with the food of heaven and every day you are fed with the food of life and every day your pockets are filled with the diamonds of God which we lost those are spiritual diamonds all right then let's go now into the gospel of John again you see I like John don't I this is purely a coincidence but it shows you the amount of instruction that comes from John for the spiritual life is a really valuable book. And I got a lot of understanding from John. Bless him. Uh, he was also enlightened by Elohim, the light of the world. So it says, it is the spirit that quickens, brings you back to life. The flesh profits nothing, gains or advances nothing, zero. Don't waste your time there. We did enough of that already. The words that I, the Messiah, speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. Why did I put that there? Because I've just been talking about the two methods of seeing. You saw and you understand external seeing. Now you need the light of the words of God in your soul to illuminate your inner path. That's the two methods of seeing. That's the two sides of the coin. One will make religion, one will create the spiritual journey and your advance back to where you was before. They are spirit and they are life. That's eternal life. That's eternal light. That's your illumination. That's your enlightenment. So now we're going to go uh, to John 8, 43 to 47. John 8, 43 to 47. Watch this. This is a debate with Jesus, and I've talked about these things before. But I've given you this as an example of two kinds of people. The Christ, because he was fully human, and the Pharisees and Sadducees, the priesthood. Watch this. John, Gospel of John 8, 43, 47. Why do you not understand my speech? Even because you cannot hear my word. See the difference then looking at everything external, fallen understanding. You, oh sorry, it says ye, and ye means all of you. All of you are of your father, the devil. Boom. Does that shock you? Shocked me when I first learned it. When we're fallen, our father is the devil. We're off his seed. That's why we have all these disgusting characteristics flying around this world. That's why we have all this chaos and trouble. Ye, all of you, are of your father, the devil. And the lusts of your father, you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning. Jesus is prophesying his own death right there. Because he knew what they were going to do already. Because he knew what he came to do. So he knew it was going to happen. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode. He didn't remain in the truth, the light. Because there is no truth, no light in him. When he speaks a lie, darkness, he speaks of his own. His own? Yes. A fallen population of the world. The children of darkness he's speaking of his own children that's populated this world stolen this world took everything and made it their own but not for long not for long thank god he was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there is no truth no light in him when he speaks a lie darkness he speaks of his own his own children for he is a liar and the father of it. So we're the children of the liar, the children of lies, and we lie. We have the same characteristics. And because I tell you the truth, you believe me not. Because I give you light, you reject it because you're children of darkness. And darkness has no part with light, and light has no part with darkness. That's why Christ was rejected. That's why I also get rejected for the same reasons. When you follow Christ, you will become light. 
when you become light, the opposition is colossal. It's huge. So if you're gonna follow me, <laughs> you're gonna get opposition as I do. But don't worry, because the light is truth. And darkness is the absence of light. That's all it is. It's an illusion. So don't be afraid. Which of you convinces me of sin? Who's going to accuse me of sin? This is the Christ, the Messiah. And if I say the truth, light, why do you not believe in me? For all the reasons I've just said, darkness has no part with light. He that is of God hears God's words. Ye, all of ye, this is the Pharisees said the priesthood, the scribes, ye therefore heard them not because ye, all of you, are not of God. You have to be born again. You have to be born of the Spirit. I'm sorry, you can't make progress without this birth. And this birth is the divine seed, not human seed. Human seed is the seed of corruption, as Peter tells us. But you're born of the seed of the word, which is planted into the heart. And as long as you water that and feed that, it can only reproduce itself. Christ in you. The divine light in you. The divine light enlightenment. God with us. That's the object of this exercise. Whew, pretty scary. No. It's immense joy that you're now on something real and not something that's a waste of time. As Paul says, punching the air, getting nowhere. So we go from there to Matthew 13, 14 to 17. Hold on to your trousers because each scripture will shine light. Each scripture will show you carefully that all that I'm telling you is divine truth. In them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah. This is Jesus speaking again. Which says, by hearing, you shall hear and shall not understand. This is Isaiah 700 years before Christ. He's actually prophesying the time of Christ and humanity at his time and our time. By hearing, you shall hear and shall not understand. And seeing, you shall see and shall not perceive. For this people's heart is waxed, gross, hard. And their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes they have closed. Lest that's just in case, at any time, any time, notice any time you decide, any time, that's not there by accident. In case at any time, they should see with their eyes, that's the inner eyes, and hear with their ears, the inner ear. And should understand with what? With their heart. That's the seat of God. That's the throne of God. And should be converted. And what? I, the Christ, should heal them. Why? Because you are spiritually sick. All what Jesus Christ did in his ministry, his earthly ministry, was pointing to the higher realm. Yes, he opened the eyes of the blind, but he was pointing to the higher realm, showing humanity that he has to open your eyes. He opened the ears of the deaf. He released those who were in captivity of their own flesh, paralyzed. He, he healed the lepers. That's corruption that comes from within you. Leprosy is ugly. Pieces fall off of you. You lose pieces of fingers and toes and you go blind. This is exactly the symptoms of humanity. He raised the dead. We were speaking about being raised by the same power as Christ. Because he's showing you a model of what he's got to do in the kingdom of God with you. All those things that he did were not accident. They were specifically designed to show you that these miracles, miraculous events, have to take place in yourself. Otherwise, you will stay in the blindness of which you was born. You will stay in the deafness of which you was born. You will stay paralyzed. You will stay falling to pieces and ugliness of, of uh, leprosy will be in you.
Leprosy is extremely ugly. What's that got to do with me? Everything. Because sin is ugly. You've seen the fruits of sin. It's ugly. That's a metaphor. Sorry, leprosy is a metaphor of that ugliness that is in all of humanity. I don't care where you come from on this globe. You have leprosy from birth. But blessed are your eyes. Who are we speaking to now? We're speaking to the humble. We're speaking to the babies. Blessed are your eyes for they see. It's not external. It's internal from the heart. And your ears for the hear. For verily, that means 100%. I say unto you that many prophets and righteous men have desired to see the things which you see, which all of you now see. And have not seen them. And to hear those things which you hear. And have not heard them. So our time is a time of huge privilege. And we've been in the process of crucifying Christ. Don't waste any more time. Be humble. Be pure in heart. And listen to those words in your own heart. Let them take effect in you. So that you can be raised from the dead and walk as a child of light. Now, to give you confirmation of what I am saying, I'll give you this last piece of scripture before we conclude today. And I think that what we've achieved today has been pretty marvelous because we've nailed down exactly the meaning of everything so that we can go forward into these wonderful deep spiritual teachings that are available for all humanity but you need the eyes and the ears to see otherwise you will not receive the blessings that are within so let's see what god has done and paul tells us in 1 corinthians 2 9 to 16 get a hold of this because this is exciting to me i just love reading this I could read this over and over and over because it tells you what I am saying is absolutely 100% truth. This is how you authenticate. Authenticate means check out what I'm saying. Check it out what I'm saying. Here we go. 1 Corinthians 2, 9 to 16. Let's go. As it is written, get that. As it is written, I has not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart, the heart of man, the things which God has prepared for them that love him. That was a piece of Isaiah. You can find that in Isaiah 64, 4. That's what is being quoted by Paul. Isaiah 64, 4. That's the introduction. And then he goes on. But God has revealed them, exposed them unto us by what? By his spirit. That's how you understand God, not by flesh. For the spirit searches all things, yea, the deep things of God. The deep things of God. You'll never see them without the spirit. For what man knows the things of man? Now, this is a comparison. What man knows the things of man? Save except the spirit of man which is in him. What spirit is this that's in man? I read you before the other session. It's the spirit of rebellion. The spirit that follows the course of this world. Who follows Satan, the prince of the power of the air. That's the spirit. For what man knows the things of man, the fallen spirit, save the spirit of man which is in him. The fallen spirit is in him. Even so, just like that, the things of God knows no man, but the spirit of God. So because man is fallen and also of the spirit of rebellion, he can't know anything of God until he receives the spirit of God. There it is. Check it. Authenticate it. Now, we have received not the spirit of the world. You already had that. Didn't need that. We're dying to that. But the spirit which is of, of 
God, the spirit which comes from God. That, why? For this reason. We might know the things that are freely given to us of God, which things also we speak, not in the words of man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. You've seen me comparing spiritual things with spiritual things. I taught you the sheep. I taught you the pigs. I taught you the fox. I've taught you the eye, physical. And this is what we do. We use the physical things for a springboard into the spiritual things. And that's what you've got to learn to do. But the natural man, that's the physical fallen man with the fallen spirit, receives not the things of the spirit of God, for they <laughs> are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them. Because... They are spiritually discerned. They are spiritually understood. They are spiritually perceived. You can't perceive with the external eye these things. But he that is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. We are born of the spirit, no longer live in the flesh. We was crucified with Christ. We put that behind us. So you can't judge me. I've already been judged. I was already condemned to death because of my sin. And I have been killed in Christ, buried in Christ, and now I'm raised by the Spirit in Christ. Do you understand that? It's fantastic. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we, those who are born of the Spirit, have what? The mind of Christ. The light. We have that same light that is given to us by grace now. I hope you enjoyed today. I hope it was of value. And I hope it will inspire you to check me out, to check out more things and see what is hidden within the words of even more things. We're going to do it together step by step each week. But I enjoyed being with you. I hope you enjoyed being with me in this little shoebox. And I look forward to seeing you soon i hope in fact even in the next session where we'll take another little step into the mysteries of god so my prayer for you is that god the almighty elohim will fill you with the eternal light of truth and that truth which is the only reality will make the lies of illusion collapse within you and you will leave the world of the pigs and you will turn 180 degrees back to your eternal father who is already waiting for you to make that decision. Remember Jesus said, those who received him, he will give you power to become the sons of God. God bless you with love light and peace. Shalom.